when you were saying that the, the homunculus, it's a, it's a foolish model in some ways, what about global workspace theory? As far as I understand, I don't know much about it. I just had a cursory glance at it. It sounds like there's a homunculus because there's something that's viewing or there's a... Well, you can explain it much better than I, but what are your, what are your views on the global workspace theory? So the global workspace theory is, is one of the sort of most popular theories in consciousness science, neuroscientific theories these days. And it's, um, it's first developed by Bernie Bars and, and taken on mainly by Stan Hain in Paris, a neuroscientist. And it makes a very simple sort of uh, proposal that what we are conscious of, the contents of our consciousness, they become conscious in virtue of being broadcast in this workspace in the brain that gives them access to many different cognitive processes, which is why I'm conscious of this glass of water means I can do many things now in virtue of being conscious of it. I can drink it. Mm -hmm. I can tip it over the computer. Mm -hmm. I can take it to the kitchen. I can put it down again, drink from it. I can talk about it. Um, And so that, uh, whatever in my brain is representing the perception of that glass has access to all these different flexible cognitive processes. And for global workspace theory, it's that process of being available, broadcasted around this workspace that endows that perception with the property of being conscious. Um, the analogy, I think it's done it again, uses the analogy fame in the brain for that. Fame in the brain? Fame in the brain. So something becomes... Famous? Famous within the brain. All other parts of the brain know about it. Suddenly, my, la- my mm. auditory cortex knows about it. My language centers know about it. My motor cortex knows about it. It's famous. There's a cup. There's a, there's a glass of water. Hooray. Everybody can see it. It's famous. Yeah. And that fame in the brain underwrites conscious perception. Um, so that's, that's the claim. The nice thing about it is it explains a lot of the functional properties we associate with consciousness, because indeed there are things I can do when I'm conscious of something that I can't when I'm not. Yes. And this flexible action is, is, is central to that. It's also testable because you can put people in brain scanners and change, you know, present them with stimuli and vary whether they're consciously perceived or not. And you can look for is there this ignition of this global workspace in the, in the brain when they're conscious? And you know, many experiments would say there is. The issue with it is that it's not, for me, explaining a great deal about, and back where we, and as we sort of begin to wrap up, we're back where we started, which is with phenomenology. So the fact that something is famous in the global workspace explains a lot about what we can do behaviorally and functionally but it doesn't really explain to me, at least, well, why is, it, why is this visual experience the way it is? The phenomenology of this visual experience has a character. Just being famous in the global workspace doesn't really ex- explain that. It also is not going to address the hard problem of consciousness. No yeah, one, that's what I'm thinking. Any, no, one would, no one would claim that it is. But there's this often inverse relationship. It has a benefit of being eminently testable. Um, and although, you know, you can finesse it and say, well... The global workspace is wherever you find it in the brain. And there are problems because how do I separate the signature of a workspace being active from simply my consciously reporting something has happened? Um, you know, maybe the difference I'm seeing in the brain is, the, is just the difference in my verbal report rather than in the mechanisms that give rise to the experience. So there are, there are some tough questions there too, but it's... it's uh, it's an appealing theory. I, you know, I don't focus on it because for me, I want to focus on what kinds of mechanisms explain phenomenology. And for me, the Bayesian perspective is much, is much uh, more interesting. 